very nostalgic to come to the building today. I was remembering back, having grown up in Bismarck, North Dakota, remembering back to the last time I had been in the surrounding area, which was the Civic Center. Uh, the event center wasn't built then. And I remember I, I came to see Garth Brooks perform in November of 1997. I always wanted to be a country music singer. I just couldn't sing, so I had to go into science. So the title of my talk is, Don't Breathe Until You Hear This. So I started my journey in science right up the road, just a few blocks from here actually, at Bismarck High School, graduating in 1993. And I had a, a very outstanding science teacher by the name of Mr. Wade Forrester, who really instilled in us students the main pillars of science. Those are reliability, being able to trust the data, reproducibility, being able to replicate your findings, but also adaptability, being able to adapt as the data comes out, adapt how you look at things, how you uh, address a question, come up with an answer. And so from there, I went to Boston University. I was at Boston where I did a bachelor's degree in psychology and biology, and really grew to appreciate those main tenets of science. From Boston, I came back to North Dakota and initially took a pause on medical school and did a master's degree in physiology in Grand Forks, where I was able to really bring those tenets of science into the lab where I studied the role of diabetes on the heart. From then, having finished the master's, I pursued a PhD, graduating in 2003. It's interesting, um, I then went to the University of Southern California, Grand Forks to Los Angeles. It's a big change in environments. Um, so I was doing what's called a postdoctoral fellowship, which is a residency in research, if you will, in cardiovascular physiology. And I remember one day I was driving into work where I worked for a very famous cardiologist, world-renowned, who's still there today. Um, and I, of course, wanted to impress the new boss, right? I was just this kid from North Dakota. Um, he probably had never visited here. Um, so I was coming into work one day and it was very smoggy outside. And it was a day when you actually had to have the windshield wipers on. Um, there was that much stuff in the air. Those of you who live locally may have seen in the last couple days where we had wildfires from Canada. You actually felt it outside and they issued air alerts. So I came into work that day and I went into his office and I really wanted to impress him and I said, um, Dr. Cloner, which was his name, I'm curious what the effect of all this stuff in the air is on the heart. He looked at me and he said, there's not gonna be any effect on the heart. It's gonna be an effect on the lungs, right? You're gonna breathe it, stuff in from the environment. It's gonna affect the lungs. That could affect the heart, I guess. And I said, of course, you're absolutely right. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, and then I went in the lab and proved him wrong. So you have to adapt to the environment. We did some initial studies where we showed that in a preclinical or animal model, if you expose animals to air pollution, there's a direct effect on the heart. These particles in the air, or what's called particulate matter, can actually get through the blood vessels into the circulation and directly affect the heart, and no one had ever seen that before. So this was really the start of a field called environmental cardiology. What's interesting, most people think of air pollution and they think of big cities, LA, Beijing, Shanghai, etc. Some of the highest air pollution levels are in the summer in places like North Dakota, where farming is the predominant occupation. So when crops are taken down, all those chemicals that are used to treat the crops, those chemicals are re-aerosolized into the air. I remembered back to a, a colleague of mine at University of North Dakota. She was studying the, uh, the role of the environment 
and correlations between where a child's bedroom was to the farm fields and the rates of ADHD. Interesting, we now know that exposure to high levels of air pollution can cause greater incidence of neurodegenerative, de, de, neurodegenerative disease, Alzheimer's disease, et cetera. So after this real um, interesting finding at the University of Southern California, I took my interest in the enviro environmental effects on the heart to the Ohio State University where I've been for 15 years. Started a lab, started out very small, and was really looking at that one question, which was, does where you live potentially affect your health, okay? So we've shown that exposure to long-term air pollution causes heart disease. Short-term air pollution exposure can cause heart disease. That if you expose a pregnant rat the baby rats, who they themselves were not exposed, at adulthood can have heart disease, okay? Obviously, this is a very confined environment, but guess what, folks? We're all living in an exposure chamber because everything that we breathe can potentially affect your heart if it can get into the circulation. So we began some interesting studies when I started in Columbus, Ohio with electronic cigarettes. So many of, the, many of us know what those, what those products are. At the time when I had moved to Ohio, this is really when they, they started to emerge. So there are many different iterations, you'll see on the right, first generation are the first type of devices, up through the fourth generation or the, or, um, the fourth uh, iteration of these devices. On the far left, these initial ones were designed to simply look like cigarettes, whereas on the fourth, these are what are called jewels, and many of you have, may have heard of those. These were initially came on the market in 2003, and they came on for good reasons, to help those who smoke quit. They've done that in adults. We know there's data showing that those who use these to quit are able to do so at a greater rate than those who simply try, who try to quit cold turkey, if you will. So these were originally designed for adults. What's interesting is the fourth generation you see here on the far right, the Joule device. The Joule device was created by scientists at Stanford University, but what they did is they changed the chemistry of the liquid that was used to hold the nicotine and other flavorings. So they changed the pH in order to make these chemicals more palatable for younger people. So the first generation on the far left, adolescents could not use these. It was too harsh for them because of the pH of the liquid. But this smart, this smart manufacturer decided if they changed the pH, that actually younger people who had never used regular cigarettes could actually use these devices. So guess what, folks? Younger generations got addicted. Recent studies show that 25% of high school seniors have said that they use these, okay? There's, I have, a, I have a sister in the audience who's a fourth grade teacher and she's seen these in her classroom. Lo they look like USB devices, okay? So they can easily go unnoticed. So we know on the, on the left hand side, we know that in adults, E-cigarette exposure can affect the heart by causing arrhythmias, causing heart disease, et cetera. And we've, we've worked in this area for a long time. We got one of the largest grants from the American Heart Association to look at this actually in adolescence, okay? So we have a preclinical model of adolescence. We have a paper coming out shortly that'll show that adolescents who had never used regular cigarettes who start with these electronic products long-term have significant cardiovascular disease just by using these devices. And these are great study subjects 
because we can study them in isolation. There's no other environmental factors that are altered because we control all of that. But guess what? Those adolescents that you see standing outside or that are sneaking the use of these products within, um, within a building, if you will, are likely to have significant effects long term. They've only been out for a few years and we don't know what's gonna happen long term. So we were making a great traction in this research area and then 2020 hit. 2020, as we know, changed all of our lives. Those of us in research were told, you have to stop all your research, you can't go into the buildings. Those of us, or those of you who know a scientist know that if you tell them they can't work, it doesn't go over well, okay? So what did I do? I picked up the phone and I called the head of our medical school and I said, how can I continue to work? And he laughed and said, I'm not shocked you're calling. He said, you have to work on COVID. So guess what? COVID-19 is a virus that's, involved, that's in the environment, right? You breathe it, it's simply a sized particle. A virus has a size. That virus can actually, if you breathe it, can get into your bloodstream and affect your heart. So we started looking at this area. Adapt to your environment. Our environment had changed. We had to adapt to it, okay? What's interesting is we began these studies and we then got a call, and this is, these are pictures from some of my lab group. We were asked to come up with a way of making the liquid where the, te the uh, tube, which many of you are familiar with, um, was placed into for storage in order to test for the virus. At this time, the supply chain had broken. We couldn't order these chemicals. So we had to figure out a way to make this chemical with what we had available within the labs. So in three days, we did just that. We've just published those results in a, in a journal where we used common, common lab chemicals uh, in order to come up with a solution. And then we were tasked even further by the state of Ohio where they said, great, we're gonna make you the sole producers of these test kits for the whole state of Ohio. I said, we're a cardiology lab. I don't barely know how to spell virology. They said, figure it out. So guess what? We had to adapt and this is where we began to innovate. We started making about 2,000 of these per day in the first couple days. At the peak in April and May of 2020, we were making 15,000 test kits per day, okay? And this was when only six or 7,000 people were getting tested per day, and so there, we were able to build up a large amount. So we did this for eight months. Thankfully now, these are available by large manufacturers, so we were able to go back to our work. But what we did is we took the knowledge that we gained with looking at COVID-19 and began to look at the combined effects of COVID-19 and e-cigarettes. And so you'll see here on the left, this is a, a quote from uh, Healthline, Healthline, which is a large medical blog and publication online where we talked and we showed that those who use e-cigarettes are much more susceptible to COVID-19 than those who don't, and they actually have a worse course with the disease. This was quite interesting, but it was brand new. This is a new disease, but this is also a new product, right? The electronic nicotine delivery devices. On the right, this was uh, an appearance on NPR's uh, Marketplace. Um, there's a blog or a uh, podcast called Make Me Smart. Um, it was interesting going on for an area I knew nothing about a few months ago, and now I was, I was giving advice to the world as a special correspondent on Marketplace. The cool part was it was with my colleague and classmate from Bismarck High School a couple blocks up the road, Molly Wood. We graduated together. So this was really cool. They were making f fun of us and we had to say, of course, you betcha, um, because that, who's been in North Dakota, that's a common term. Um, but it was really interesting to be able to use the, the knowledge we had gained because we adapted to our environment and we innovated. So folks, go out of your comfort zone. Learn from your environment and change, use the data. Science has been thrown in the spotlight. 
but use that data in order to make the necessary changes to move on. Thank you.